Bueno, voy a eh, presentar a la doctora Elena Longino. We are very, very happy to have you here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, bueno, brevemente, eh, no, no, haré, no haré justicia del currículo que tiene la doctora Longino, pero rápidamente eh, se licenció por Barnard College eh, en 1966, obtuvo un máster en filosofía por la Universidad de Sussex en el 67 y se doctoró por la Universidad John Hopkins en 1973. Sus intereses docentes de investigación se centran en filosofía de la ciencia, epistemología social y la filosofía feminista. Además de numerosos artículos, es autora de Science and Social Knowledge, The Fate of Knowledge, Studying Human Behavior, eh, y bueno, entre otras muchas eh, muy, muy eh, importantes publicaciones. Es profesora emérita de filosofía de eh, C.I. Lewis en la Universidad de Stanford y pues eh, es también afiliada del Stanford Books Institute for the Environment. Eh, ha, ha sido afiliada a los programas de estudios feministas, de género y de sexualidad, de pensamiento moderno y literatura, el programa de historia y filosofía de la ciencia y ciencia, tecnología y sociedad. Um, pues estamos muy contentos de tenerlos aquí. Eh. Oh, muchas gracias. with the sciences, and maybe some are actually practicing science. So we might ask, well, why do we pursue philosophy of science? And of course, science is a human activity. Um, and in the sciences, when we do philosophy of art, we want to understand the activity of art making. So um, when we want to understand the human activity of science, we ask, what's the point? What are the norms that govern the activity? What are the outcomes of the activity? what constitutes success. But um, uh, for whom do we uh, pursue philosophy and science? Are we doing it for scientists? Well, some scientists, especially in uh, the biological sciences, are interested in what philosophers have to say. Physicists, not so much. <laughs> uh, and very public, one might add. Um, do we do it for other philosophers? Uh, do we do it for historians of science and other scholars? Um, well, that makes it a very kind of internal discussion. Um, but given that the sciences play such a large role in contemporary science societies and economies, I think academics should not be the only audience for our work, um, and that we as philosophers should include in our domain the role that science plays in the larger society. And this is certainly a question that has been pursued um, uh, in various ways in the last, um, I would say, 30 to 50 years in philosophy of science. Um, but then that changes uh, the questions. Um, when we're understanding science as a human activity, we want to know what are its social consequences. How is it working? And, of course, we also ask, how is its pursuit affected by the society in which it is pursued? Um, and for whom do we do this? Well, not for ourselves, but we do this somehow for society at large. For those who would rely on the sciences, 
um, rely on information that has the certificate of scientific attached to it. Um, um, and uh, for those, in, in any case, who use, who use the sciences. Um, and there's been lots of work uh, that exposes the role that the scientists have played in, say, supporting inequality, racial inequality, uh, looking at all the work in the 19th and 20th centuries of racial differences, gender inequality, all the work um, in the 19th and earlier. Um, we go back to Aristotle, if we wish, um, uh, that legitimate uh, gender inequality. Um, there's also work, of course, that documents how the scientists contribute to ameliorating problematic social conditions, pollution, disease, um, and uh, analyzing the contributions of the scientists to uh, technological development. So there's a good side and a bad side uh, when we try to think about the role that the scientists play in the larger society. Um, today, I want to talk not so much on the content of the sciences, what they say, um, as on an image of science, a conception of what science is, um, uh, and to think about how that contributes in particular to the maintenance of problematic relations between global north and south, and also problematic relations within the south. Um, so this is what I'm what we're doing is offering a new context for an argument that I've offered um, uh, before about um, the traditional epistemic, cognitive, or scientific values as contrasted with an alternative set of values, um, which um, I originally called feminist values because I discovered them articulated most fully in work by feminist uh, scientists and uh, scholars of science. I talked about this in a bunch of uh, different papers as I was trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to say. So today I'm going to give a few, again, oriented remarks, um, and then go back over the arguments that I have offered in the past um, about um, uh, those um, values that serve as cognitive or epistemic values for two different research communities, and I'll introduce uh, some different language that I want to use, the language of virtues and the language of heuristics. Um, uh, and then um, I want to talk about uh, a different case where these so-called um, uh, different sets of values play um, a, a political role. Um, and um, here I'm drawing on many conversations and work that I'm performing with a colleague um, in India who is an agricultural economist. And, um, so that's, that's where that part will be drawn from. And then I'll conclude with some reflections on the case that uh, Dr. Ryan and Dr. So um, first of all, I said I'm introducing language, or we're talking about values or virtues. Well, often I use these interchangeably. Um, and in this context, it doesn't make that much difference. But um, technically, values are the attitudes one takes towards um, actions or qualities or objects as one can value the loyalty of a friend or one can assign value to the loyalty of a friend, and one can assign uh, a quite different value to the friend's disloyalty. Um, virtues, on the other hand, are properties of the things that are valued. Um, there are qualities in virtue of which we value uh, those things. So the friend's loyalty is a virtue of that friend. So moving into the sciences, one can value the simplicity of the theory as contrasted with a competing theory, which, say, invokes more kinds of entities, more kinds of processes, and so forth. Um, and um, we can talk about the simplicity of the theory being a virtue of the theory. So you can see why they'd be used um, interchangeably, but there is technically a difference uh, between them. Um, so why would we want to um, Think about these. 
Well, um, certainly there's the aim of uh, clarifying the ideals of value freedom or value neutrality, which is often attributed to the science, as the science is taken to be reliable because they are value neutral, they don't reflect or favor uh, any uh, set of uh, values. Um, we might want to clarify the elements of uh, scientific reasoning. We might want to clarify relations among um, value-related concepts in philosophy of science. And there are lots of normative concepts that we use in philosophy of science. And so we might want to think about their interrelations. Um, we might want to provide guidance for maximizing objectivity and reliability. And again, for whom? Well, again, not necessarily for the practice of scientists. Um, and the underlying question, I think, um, when we're thinking about this, why um, should we accept the claims and instructions that are the result of scientific investigation instead of claims that have other justifications, whether those are religious, political, uh, traditional? Um, and that question, that there are ways of identifying what is scientific and what is not. Um, so, in, in a brief note, and actually in my own very earliest uh, work, I, along with the others, have genuflected to um, the, what do I call the traditional theoretical virtues. Um, in um, Science of Social Knowledge, I used the uh, distinction between constitutive and contextual values, and these, I thought, were constitutive values. That they, that they were values that were somehow constitutive, internal to science. Uh, so, and that's what just about any other philosopher thinking about science in the 1990s uh, with uh, said. What do they include? Uh, well, um, empirical adequacy or accuracy, that is um, uh, adequacy to the empirical data that um, one has that one wants to explain or to use as uh, evidence. Um, internal consistency, namely that the theory or the model is itself uh, coherent or consistent. Um, simplicity, which can be ontological, that is, uh, and it's, of course, a relative quality. A simple theory has fewer kinds of entities than uh, a less simple theory. Um, or nomological, a simple theory evokes fewer number of distinct processes than one that is less simple. Um, uh, another virtue of a theory is its explanatory power, namely the, its generality, how much of its uh, scope of uh, its uh, explanatory extent, how many kinds of processes can be incorporated um, into its explanatory umbrella. Um, another way of thinking about this is its universality. Um, um, and uh, finally, another uh, virtue is the fruitfulness of a theory, that's Kuhn's idea. Um, but in other articulations, it's testability. Maybe. That the theory has empirical consequences that can be tested. Um, put to the test, that then puts the theory to the test. And um, so these are not all maximally satisfiable. There are trade offs. There are obvious trade-offs between empirical adequacy or accuracy and generality. Uh, empirical adequacy and accuracy, you can get very detailed descriptions of uh, the phenomena as your data, uh, but it's not clear that those descriptions make it into the um, uh, 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 explanatory uh, models or theories that we have um, when we Articulate a theory at the level of generality that we see. Generally, the predictions that we generate from the theory don't exactly match up with the empirical data. So, they get close enough. 
So it depends on whether you value uh, accuracy over uh, universality where you are going to place the emphasis. But um, the idea, of course, is that these are features um, that are valued because they are either thought to be truth indicative, that is a theory that all else being equal, uh, or let's say of two theories, all else being equal, the one that um, scores better um, on the possession of these virtues is more likely to be true than one that does not. So that the competitor that does not score as hard on possession of these virtues. That's what it means to be truth indicative. Um, so people like uh, Bernard Cohen and Walt Churchland took these to be uh, truth indicative. Thomas Kuhn um, uh, thought of them as defining science. Um, you may remember um, that in the postscript to one of the editions of um, Scientific Revolutions, uh, Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and also in um, his uh, Essential Tensions book. Um, he said, well, of course, um, uh, paradigms are incommensurable, but um, what, um, what enables scientists working in one paradigm to recognize what is going on in another paradigm as scientific is that they share, uh, they value, they both value these virtues. They, they are both looking to maximize these virtues. There are all kinds of problems with, with uh, what he said. That's not our topic today. Um, so, um, and these are characteristics again of the content that is produced uh, by scientists, and so we should distinguish them from other virtues that one might seek to maximize in cognitive context, which are the qualities not of content but of cognitive agents. So we might think that humility. Openness to alternatives, clarity of argument, for example, are virtues. These are virtues of the agents who are pursuing uh, pursuing knowledge, and um, often they are uh, discussed under the umbrella of intellectual virtues. Okay. Well, looking at uh, work that was being done by feminist scientists and then uh, feminist philosophers and historians of science, uh, starting in the 70s and going on through um, until now, one has seen um, some quite different properties of scientific content being valued. So quite different properties um, being uh, sought um, and valued as virtues of theories or models. Empirical adequacy, of course. Nobody's going to deny that empirical adequacy is a virtue. Of course, uh, you can ask, adequate to what? So that's a question about what data uh, we are going to uh, be uh, prioritizing in, um, in our work. Um, also, uh, now we start to get something different. Um, uh, novelty is value. Um, ontological heterogeneity. Um, is, um, is valued, um, mutuality of or reciprocity of interaction, um, which values complexity or nonlinear explanations, um, and instead of testability or uh, fruitfulness, um, the outward looking uh, virtues are applicability to human needs and decentralization of power. And so these are the virtues that. Um, in many of the feminist texts that were being produced in the, in sort of the heyday of, um, of feminist advocacy with regard to sciences, these are the virtues I think that were being um, uh, highlighted as uh, important to a feminist approach in the sciences. So I'm going to say something about each of them. Why were they valued? Well, empirical adequacy, of course, was valued because um, it uh, would help avoid the universal masculine. The universal masculine is the practice of treating as an exemplar of the species, the males of the species. You see this in grammar, when we use the masculine the grammatical gender to talk about someone who is not known to us. Um, uh, 
uh, but it occurs uh, all over the place. It's not just a dramatic issue. Um, and um, the importance here is that um, if we are the claims that if we're really going to be inherently adequate to the data, then we cannot um, overlook the uh, sex and gender differences um, in the distribution of biological behavioral traits. Um, so we have to pay attention um, to the data. Um, novelty um, is advanced because um, uh, as, as a goal to help reject the constraints that may invisibly reinforce androcentrism, whether in one's theories or in one's um, observations. Um, one thing with regard to empirical adequacy, uh, for example, is that uh, there, I do not know the situation here in Mexico. I don't know the politics, I don't know the history, but in the United States, it was a, a, a political struggle to get um, attention to specific women's health issues, the ways in which the distribution of certain diseases vary um, across the genders. Heart disease presents differently in women than it does in men. Um, certain cancers are more prevalent in women than in men, and in men uh, than in women. So there are important gender differences in, um, in, uh, in health, and the health research was uh, focused on a generic male subject. So the generic male subject was the source of universal claims about the efficacy of treatment, the uh, distribution and frequency of certain health conditions, and so on. And it was a, it was a struggle it was a political struggle to um, bring about a change which uh, imposed on the National Institutes of Health the requirement to include um, uh, specimens of different sex, not just in human trials, but also in animal trials. Um, so um, it's, that was um, the, the role of empirical adequacy, adequacy there. Which data? Do we want our models to be adequate to? Um, ontological heterogeneity. Um, here, the idea is that we want models that tolerate different kinds of basic or causally effective entities in the theoretical domain. Um, we want to preserve causally relevant differences in the observational record. So, rather than trying to average out. Um, uh, causal processes into, say, one value. We want to preserve uh, relevant differences uh, among them. Um, avoid treating males as species exemplars, uh, which will mean uh, incorporating in our models or theories qualitatively different kinds of um, agents. So there are going to be different agents in the ontology. Um, treating females as independent agents, um, and uh, treating female-associated properties as worthy of investigation. These all, I think, come under uh, the virtue of ontological homogeneity for feminists. Um, another uh, was mutuality of interaction. And here, the point is to avoid treating dominance as a major explanatory principle. Um, so to reject, uh, in doing ethology, to reject male dominance uh, as an explanatory principle, both in, not only in ethology, but also in economics. So the decisions of a group, the behavior of a group, is not uh, determined by some dominant male in the group, but there are other effective actors um, uh, in the group. Um, and also uh, look at uh, the ways in which collaboration is uh, an important uh, factor in determining um, how things go uh, in a group. Um, it also evo it is, uh, involves avoiding the active-passive dichotomy as an organizing principle. So the rejection of master molecule explanations that uh, in looking at a process seek to identify the molecule that is the initiator and controller of the process. Uh, most famously, some gene 
that will control some factor, whether that's eye color or intelligence. Um, um, and uh, so multi-factor multi explanations, and also looking at interaction, um, not just looking at multiple factors involved in the direction of uh, a phenomenon, but also the interaction of entities in a domain. So in economics in particular, um, bargaining in the household as opposed to the treatment of one member of the household, uh, often called uh, the benevolent patriarch, um, as the controller of household uh, consumption decisions. Um, attending to multiple causal factors uh, in the process, both within an organism and also external to the organism, um, and attending to multiple actors in primary populations uh, or groups. So those are all uh, uh, virtues of the particular of the content, um, in, internal to the content. Um, the other virtues, um, which I think are paired with things like fruitfulness and or testability, um, are outward looking, um, and uh, one that was emphasized was the um, importance of developing uh, sciences that uh, would alleviate uh, human needs, and especially those that are um, attended uh, by women. But the alleviation of human suffering uh, was uh, one important goal uh, for science. Um, so theories or models that had the capacity to do that would be favored over those that did not. And um, also, we find in this literature um, the valuation of models that seem to decentralize power. And of course, go along with, with uh, virtues and uh, complexity and so on. So, here, the idea would be to empower the beneficiaries of science and technology. Um, so to favor models that uh, empower um, the beneficiaries um, and um, that are less likely to be used in reproducing dependent solutions. So I'm going to go try to go a little bit more quickly through um, uh, these. I've already talked about this. Yeah. The, the, the simplicity, um, the, the traditional, the views of only males, generic males in animal studies, whereas uh, uh, advancing the virtue of heterogeneity, you want to study populations that reflect gender and other diversity and track their different responses uh, to treatment. Um, in economics, the traditional virtues uh, support simple causal models and broad explanatory scope. So think of the household as a single command unit um, governed by the benevolent patriarch. Uh, whereas um, in the alternative uh, virtues, one looks at households as composed of members with conflicting interests, um, not just the moderate aged adults, the children parents, uh, elderly parents, uh, households, uh, much more complicated. Um, and uh, also emphasize um, bargaining models, uh, interactions uh, among the members of the household. Um, so uh, to see the decision power, so in these models for decision power is not in the distributed. The biology of production and development, and with um, respect to empirical consequences, the traditional model preserves uh, the first fruitfulness, whereas um, the alternative models prefer applicability. Um, so, how are the uh, alternative models feminist? Well, they're not inherently female, and not necessarily not inherently feminist either. Um, they're alternative to the traditional ones, um, and they were, I think, valued by feminists because they could be, when, when followed, they could reveal gender. 
in ways that gender was concealed by models that satisfied the traditional virtues. And uh, as revealing gender, that would serve feminist cognitive goals, which is to understand the ways in which gender and gender differences operate, um, both in the social, human social world and in the natural world. Um, and so we have to say that the feminist character of the alternative virtues is provisional. That is, insofar as um, they serve feminist cognitive goals, we can think of them as feminist, but they're not inherently necessarily feminist. So, you say, well, okay, that's all very good, but is this science? Um, well, here, what about the traditional virtues? Um, well, well, we all want accuracy or empirical adequacy. That's shared, but of course, what are the data and what are the observations to which we want our models and theories to be adequate? So, um, let's set that question aside. Um, uh, let's think about consistency. Well, um, consistency is uh, the truth probative value of consistency is relative to the truth of the theories with which consistency is recommended. So, just because my new theory is consistent with thermodynamics, you know, it supposes that thermodynamics is correct in all the respects that are relative to this particular comparison. Well, maybe that's true, but there may be other theories where the um, um, adequacy or correctness of the theory is more in, more in question. So it depends on what theory we're talking about. And when we want consistency um, with theories. Of course, we want a degree of internal consistency. Aristotle said, if, if you can't have, you cannot have a conversation with someone who embraces a contradiction. It is just not possible. So, so if you do want a degree of internal consistency, um, uh, and, uh, you know, just to get up on it. So, and um, so that's that's only that's that not, is not in itself uh, a virtue. Um, the virtue of simplicity, I think, begs the question about um, explanation, what kinds of explanations. Do we want, do we want enough information that's sufficient to generate predictions, or do we want an account of underlying processes that produce the phenomena that are explained and predicted? Um, um, so, I think the question about the nature of explanation is begged uh, in advance of simplicity. Um, and of course, Kant taught us that there's no a priori or empirical reason to think that the universe is simple. If that's the case, which, why should our theories or models be simple? Um, and um, I think the degree of simplicity is going to be relative to the descriptive categories that are being brought to bear in the account of the domain. And finally, as I said earlier, explanatory power is often achieved at the cost of literal truth. And this, of course, is a point that we made on many things. Okay. So, neither the feminist nor the traditional virtues are probative or truth indicative. They guide inquiry. They may play a justificatory role in particular contexts for particular individuals or communities seeking to achieve certain cognitive goals. They're operative in uh, the development of theories, hypotheses, and models. So they shape questions, the questions we ask. Um, uh, they will guide the selection and representation of data. Um, they can be used to assign prima facie uh, plausibility to a model or um, a theory. But they have um, limited normative reach. And which of the virtues is going to depend on the goals of a particular investigation? What questions are being asked? What is important to know in a particular investigation? So what um, I want to suggest is that um, using value in quite different way, the value of the virtues or the values is heuristic. But it's not truth and dignity. Um, so it's, it's not ridiculous to think, to uh, appeal to um, uh, 
uh, these virtues and to think of these virtues as having some role in um, our selection of theories or models that we want to work with. But again, that's going to depend on um, which, uh, what are the goals of our particular investigation. Fine for me to say that. Fine for us if you accept all the argument. Fine for you to accept that too. But the traditional virtues continue to shape common notions of scientific knowledge, and that's that's where I want us to go uh, today. And to give an example where I think this is in operation. And um, so here, I'm talking about um, this work that I've done with my colleague, uh, Dr. Rajeshwari Raina, who is an agricultural economist in India, who has um, done field work and is currently teaching at the Shid Melbourne University. Um, I'm going to go quickly through um, these slides in order to get to the case study. Um, so, um, for what do we want agricultural science? Well, to harness biological knowledge um, and hydro and geological knowledge to improve agricultural production. Um, now, um, in India, agricultural policy has been part of um, modernization. So we have very complicated stories since um, uh, Indian independence in the late 1940s. Um, I'm sure you read in the newspapers of the Farmers' Revolt in 2022. These are mostly Punjabi farmers in the north, many of whom actually benefited initially or whose um, parents benefited from the Soviet Revolution. Um, but also in the news have been reports of farmer suicides um, all over um, uh, agricultural India in the last 15 to 20 years, um, many of them caused by farmers who are in despair over debt. They have taken on crushing debt, which they cannot repay. And this is what they see as the solution. So agriculture is in, is in, in, in crisis. India's future as um, primarily industrial. And um, he uh, thought that what would be important would be to shrink the agricultural sector. So to get more production per unit of labor uh, from the agricultural sector, and free labor to participate in industry. That was, that was I think, his. Um, his uh, vision, and um, it's rather hard uh, in many ways uh, to accomplish. Um, but one thing that seemed to jumpstart his process was the introduction of uh, hybrid seeds uh, that um, produced more seeds per plant. Plants were shorter, so they could sit out the wind. Um, and uh, because they were shorter, they didn't have as much green, they didn't take out as much water. So there, there were lots of uh, good features of these seeds. They were developed, of course, here in international research about uh, Mexico. Um, so, uh, um, but the problem with these seeds, so it was brilliant, <laughs> no doubt. But the problem with these seeds is the seeds need inputs. They need inputs to do the work that they can do. They need fertilizer and they need pesticides. But they need water. Um, and um, so the, this, this, the, the hybrid seeds and continuing development of hybrid seeds and of course now uh, genetically modified uh, seeds are, are thought to be the what is going to save um, food production, so food production for 
for the world. So the seeds, the seeds are treated as the heroes of the story. And the world has to be transformed to make the seeds work. Okay. Um, international funding agencies, um, uh, initially were, were you know, poured money into India. The national government encouraged the use of private seeds and the additional uh, inputs. Um, international agencies made loans to the government, um, and then eventually loans uh, were made to and from multi multinational corporations to build uh, the uh, infrastructure, um, especially loans to farmers uh, to install war wells so you could dig deeper and deeper to access uh, the aquifer, the water. Um, and complicated things happen with um, uh, the funding shifts. But the main the point is that the seeds were really understood as the major engine agricultural growth, and they require transformation of the context in which they were planted to realize their potential. Um, now, this did result in modest increases um, uh, for a while, um, and dramatic increases in some areas. Um, that was called the Green Revolution. Um, uh, but by the 1990s, um, uh, growth was stagnant, productivity was stagnant, um, and uh, indebtedness, even as productivity increased, indebtedness increased, hunger increased, which was not solving the problem of food, the problem of hunger. In addition, the soils were being depleted and groundwater was being uh, depleted. So um, uh, one of the, yeah, um, these failures, the increased indebtedness, soil depletion, were often attributed to inadequate implementation on the part of farmers, um, the resistance of farmers who were wedded to their traditional ways, um, or to their ignorance. So the blame, the blame for the failure was not the seeds, the blame for the failure was in um, the uh, implementation and they're, they're used by, by farmers. They were using too much water. They were using too much uh, fertilizer. They were using too much, uh, I mean, whatever. Uh, okay. Well, farmers are uh, increasingly impoverished. They're being moved off the land. Uh, uh, rural areas, uh, communities are being devastated. Uh, from suicides, you find uh, seasonal or permanent abandonment of fields. Um, and of course, in addition to these social things, there's climate change. So increased drought and variability of uh, rainfall. Um, well, what is the answer? Well, increase or maintain agricultural productivity with continued deployment of agricultural science-based technological solutions. The solution is, is got to be um, technologi technological and Maybe it's just we need a more effective transfer of knowledge from science to practice. So let's really engage the farmers in the management of production. Let's teach them modern methods, uh, methods of measurement, um, irrigation, hydrogeology, and so forth. Um, um, so this is this is really a technological solution and social only to the extent that it involves somehow an effort to transfer knowledge. The assumption being the farmers don't know anything and the knowledge the knowledge is over here and it needs to be transferred to the farmers. Um, are the ones who were um, occupying the highways on the road to, to Delhi uh, a couple of years ago. They are probably among the better off um, of the farmers. The Punjab is sort of the of uh, uh, South Asia. But in other areas, um, in, uh, especially in the Deccan Plateau, which occupies the central part of the subcontinent, 
this oil was not as fertile. Um, very different, um, very different situation. Here is where most of the father suicides um, happened. Um, most of the um, uh, migration from former villages to to cities where people just end up on the streets. Um, where the malnutrition is endemic. Okay, so. Uh, Andhra Pradesh is one of the states that occupies the Deccan uh, Plateau. Um, and there are two contrasting um, efforts um, to try to improve on the previous failure. So the, the previous failure is recognized. Um, how can it be, uh, how can we do that? Um, the Deccan Plateau is characterized by low groundwater resources, so whatever groundwater there is is recharged by rainfall. So much of the cultivation, almost all of the cultivation, is rainfall. It depends, therefore, on the um, annual monsoons. Um, and uh, climate change, of course, has reduced the dependability of rainfall. For the most part, um, subsidies and private investment here have gone to drip and sprinkler systems, um, which do uh, make, make for more efficient use of water. So you're not just flooding a field, you're actually getting the water to the plants. Um, uh, it's gone to electricity to power wells, but that of course encourages the day uh, uh, of uh, more wells. Electricity has been free uh, to power, so that encourages that way to build wells. Um, and also the fertilizing pesticide to enable the uh, stars of the show to thrive. Um, Andhra Pradesh, um, yeah. So yeah. So one of these, one of one of the two efforts um, is the Andhra Pradesh farmer managed groundwater system, um, and it emphasized knowledge transfer and capacity building. So knowledge transfer to the farmers and building their capacity, um, setting up participatory processes that are conducive to community management and. Um, introducing technologies that would support participatory hydrological monitoring, that is monitoring the use of water, the availability of water, and its use, and then also uh, to budget water for crops. Um, and so their effort was to provide the necessary means, the equipment, and the knowledge, which would collect and analyze rainfall and groundwater data that would then increase community understanding of groundwater resources. Now, what's important is that in this project, the community was understood to be the well owners in the community, those who already had um, access to water in the property, which amounted to about 60, less than 60% of the farmers in the community that they were working in. Um, the problem was conceived as diminishing water, and the solution was to provide technological support for water conservation and uh, a sustainability of those supports through the education of the farmers. Um, so there were some positive results. Um, there was a shift to less water-intensive crops by those who had water access, but there was no discernible reduction in the overall groundwater use. So overall, groundwater use remained the same. The inequalities uh, persisted, um, and the already poor were increasingly immiserated. Um, and communities continue to disintegrate. Um, another project uh, yeah, um, this, uh, was initially supported by um, uh, Norwegian uh, foreign aid and then it became um, uh, supported by um, uh, more local uh, state, uh, state support. Um, the other effort um, was um, initiated by uh, Wasan, um, which is a water-focused NGO. Wasan stands for Watershed Support Services and Activities Network. Um, so they think about the entire watershed um, and the um, um, district. Now, what um, so Wasan came to the village in the Anantapur district of Andhra Pradesh, and their process 
was to engage the entire village, well owners and non well owners, in a conversation to identify how they, the villagers, understood the problem that they were facing. So, of course, there's, they're facing drought, they're facing less water, they're facing poverty, but how do they understand what is bringing this about? What do they think about this? And so, um, they uh, noticed several things. Uh, first of all, groundwater is unevenly distributed, so it exists in some pockets and not in other pockets, um, and at different depths. Um, and um, land ownership um, in India means that whoever owns uh, the, the surface, whoever is property by the surface within a certain boundary, has rights to whatever is below the surface um, encompassed by that thing. That meant that whatever water um, is, under, is underneath my plot of land is mine for my use. And if you don't have water under your plot of land, uh, or if uh, you have water at a certain depth then it's gone, well, too bad. Uh, um, now, in this village, those who still had groundwater were very concerned that those who did not would steal their water. Um, and uh, those who did not have water feared loss of their livelihoods. Um, so both of these groups were together in the same place talking about the problem. That was a science innovation here. Um, and um, the group together identified a, one problem um, uh, lack of water um, with two dimensions. There's the uncertainty of the rainfall, the failure of the monsoon, or the delay of the monsoon, which um, exacerbates water stress. And that's a physical problem. But there's also an institutional problem, and that's the, the property rights. The property rights that give the owner the water underneath their property uh, rights to the water but nobody else likes to put them. So um, in conversation, these two groups, um, each of whom was um, in states of anxiety by the situation, um, came up with um, the solution of actually letting go of the property rights, collectivizing the water that was under the entire village, um, and introducing pipelines that would distribute this collectivized water to all of the farmers in um, the village without regard to individual property rights. Property rights are a big deal. Um, I think wherever they exist, they're certainly a big deal in, in India. And this was done, um, uh, so not only was the water that collectivized, but then they all agreed on, on conditions for the shared water use, which would include a ban on new well drilling, well drilling so no more new wells, um, uh, monitoring the use of the collectivized water. Um, uh, they um, instituted regulations that required um, the farmers to use water-saving devices. Um, but importantly, everybody, everybody could participate in the monitoring, uh, whether it's monitoring the use of collectivized water or monitoring the use of the sprinklers. So everybody in the village or representatives are involved in making sure that everyone is um, uh, following the conditions that had been uh, agreed on. So this is both a social and a technological solution. But the technological solution, which agreed. I mean, it used to be, you know, sprinklers. They, they didn't invent sprinklers. Sprinklers in the technological, uh, in the technological resources. But the implementation of the solution uh, depends on the social solution. It depends on the rejection of property rights um, as the key to access to water. The results were that the groundwater levels were sustained. Um, the productivity of the cultivated areas increased, crops were diversified, and more among the poorest farmers were able to continue farming uh, under this plan. So now, this solution is local. People have looked at the success and said, oh, well, let's do this elsewhere. And I think, <laughs> um, I think what, what the lesson is that 
to scale up. You can't just take their solution and apply it somewhere else. Um, you have to address the, the broader institutional factors that sort of differentiate one area from another. And it seems to me that what needs to be uh, what needs to be shared is is not just the uh, the actual solution of collectivization, but rather the process of community-wide decision making that came up with the solution. Every community is going to have its own particular challenges, and so they're going to, if it wants to scale, that's 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 the thing to, to try to scale. It seems to me. Um, um, so, what's the relevance to all this topic of purchasing and values? Well, okay, um, you probably can see where I'm going to go. Um, when we look at the way in which agriculture uh, developed here, I think conceptions of what counts as knowledge um, have seeped into knowledge-dependent practices and have helped to shape its outcomes. Um, we see the valorization of formal cosmopolitan scientific knowledge that is generated in, say, international uh, laboratories, um, that accompanies the financial and material aid from international agencies um, that are dominated by industrialized nations and economies. So that is true, okay? Um, and um, so knowledge that is developed under traditional norms of simplicity and universality is treated as scientific. And the seeds are a universal solution to a problem, a problem that has different manifestations in different areas, in different contexts. So this, but, but the seeds are treated as the solution and, and to implement the solution, you change, change the context to make it more suitable for the, for the seeds. Um, so cognitive authority is granted to understandings that feature generalizable solutions, namely the seeds, which are transportable. You can take the seeds from a laboratory in Mexico where they were developed, and I hope did a good deal of good in Mexico. I don't know. Um, but no. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah. So, but it's supposed to be a generalizable solution. It's supposed to be what solves the hunger problem for the world. Just as now, genetically modified seeds are supposed to be what solves the hunger problem for the world. Um, um, understandings that involve uniform implementation, guidance from experts. Experts will teach us how to use the seeds, how to employ them effectively. Um, and um, uh, then understandings, uh, this is a side point that I didn't emphasize so much, but part of the idea is to incorporate the rural sector into the industrial economy. Um, and again, um, failure. Uh, was attributed to the, the farmers uh, for their stubbornness, um, their ignorance, their lack of understanding. Um, and so um, the, the solution of the first Andhra Pradesh effort that I mentioned was, of course, to teach, teach the farmers. But they selected only a subgroup of the farmers, and the idea was to give the farmers knowledge that, again, they had been developed elsewhere that they could use um, where they were. Um, so, um, we can think some more about the uh, relation between um, heuristics and uh, uh, local knowledge. Um, the uh, Wasson example uh, features site specificity of problems and solutions. Um, so variation and difference in heterogeneity um, uh, or specificity as opposed to uniformity. Um, the multidimensionality of the problem and the solution. Again, we see um, uh, complexity as opposed to simplicity, where the complexity will be erased if we take an approach that, that is, that is uh, informed by the heuristic of uh, simplicity. Um, the community generation of problem definition and control um, features the interaction of actors rather than single factor control or single factor source of uh, knowledge. Um, 
And in community generated agreements and community monitoring, we see the distribution of power that the alternative uh, heuristics favor. Um, so um, there's quite a bit of work that's been done on local knowledge. I mentioned two uh, researchers here. Much of that um, is valorizing the content of uh, local knowledge and how that qualifies as, as, as genuine knowledge by comparing it and showing how it matches up with um, accepted scientific knowledge, how distinctions that are made uh, by local communities among different kinds of fish or different plants can be um, matched with uh, distinctions that would be made using um, uh, cosmopolitan, called cosmopolitan, um, uh, cosmopolitan knowledge. What, what I'm trying to focus on is not so much the content, but how to think about how an image of science um, uh, permeates the conception of genuine knowledge um, in agricultural science in particular. Um, and its deployment in specific locations and obscures the availability of um, alternative solutions that can come from the ground up um, in those situations. When we think of knowledge in a particular way, then we are not going to look to the communities as uh, sources of knowledge and sources of uh, solutions to their own problems. So I think that image of science also adds a lot to place on an image, but I was, I think it also contributes to maintaining um, global dependency um, relations. Um, to make that argument, one has to do a lot more in the sociology of science than I think can be done. But, um, so, um, an implicit bias in favor of representations and procedures that conform to the traditional values is identifiable, I think, in the conception of what counts as real knowledge, in the expectations of its successful deployment, and in the representation of the situations in which it should be deployed. Um, I think this is just one part of a complex political intellectual orientation that's constitutive of so-called development ideology. This is clearly not, not all of it, but I think it's an important, uh, an important dimension of this. Um, and um, uh, it's, it's uh, an all exists as a kind of undercurrent that consistently prioritizes top-down technologically facilitated control over bottom-up socially generated innovation and adaptation. And there are alternatives. I mean, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, if we um, think about uh, the heuristics, um, no set is exclusively truth conducted. Um, and when a science-based approach informed by a set of heuristics leads to poor social consequences, like our suicides, like rural poverty, we shouldn't treat those as unfortunate but unavoidable collateral damage. Instead, if I'm right about any of this, we should reconsider the image of science and of knowledge that manifests um, those, those virtues that, that is guided by those heuristics. And so the alternative virtues um, or heuristics are uh, a resource for the development and valorization of alternative ways to identify problems, um, to identify the kind of knowledge that might be needed for their solutions, and what besides knowledge might be necessary. Um, there are limits to purely technological approaches, and uh, the need is not just for new technologies, but also for social innovation that enables um, the development of site-specific technology to address site-specific uh, problems. Problems that are shared, but um, are not um, universal. There's, uh, I think, still a place for the heuristics based in the traditional values. Um, in those sciences or those inquiries that concern objects and processes, um, in their shared aspects, but you have to determine that they're shared. You can't just assume that they're shared. Um, so in physics, when we're talking about particles of uniform bodies as Newton, then of course you could be um, as uh, universal as you wanted. But as soon as we start to think about uh, phenomena that are more differentiated, um, that don't share uh, important properties, then um, 
the value of, of traditional breaches is diminished. So scale, context, and goals, I think, determine um, which heuristics are going to be suited to a particular question. And um, if all this is right, then inquiry gets characterized by flexibility and an embrace of multiple intellectual resources is going to be most likely uh, to be of use in a heterogeneous world, which I think is the world we live in. Thanks. So the question is, um, can we find these alternative virtues in uh, non-feminist contexts? And I would say yes. Um, I think um, in, uh, so ecology is a very complex uh, set of sciences. Um, there are some um, uh, approaches in ecology that um, are really, um, I think, characterized by the more traditional uh, uh, virtues that are really looking for kind of simple accounts of ecological systems, trying to reduce the number of factors that uh, we can identify as causally operative. But there are other uh, approaches in ecology that emphasize uh, that emphasize the interaction among the um, uh, entities in an ecological system that um, emphasize the heterogeneity of the uh, ontology. Of an ecological system. So I think um, uh, ecological uh, and environmental science are places where one can find um, uh, these alternative virtues um, exhibited. So that's one reason why I don't want to say they're, they're exclusively feminist. One doesn't find them uh, articulated and defended in the same way one has found them uh, articulated and defended in the feminist uh, work because I think feminists were very conscious of trying to do things differently because doing things the same way simply led to the re reproduction of um, gender inequality. Um, so there was a consciousness of trying to develop knowledge that would not um, uh, persist uh, in reproducing uh, gender inequality. So that's, that's why I think there was a, just in, in, this, in this heyday of, uh, sort of well, second wave feminism in the United States, um, we, we found a, a great deal of attention, so I apologize, um, um, to, to those uh, virtues. Does that answer? We have another question. Which are the feminist goals for you? Which are feminist goals for me? Oh, well, you know. <laughs> 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 we, we can have a long conversation about this. Um, you know, there are, um, uh, okay, let me, let me try to give a quick answer, and then you can go on to talk about other things. And it's not about, about me, but I think, you know, for, um, um, you know, you can think of um, uh, some people have thought of feminism as, as very gender focused and gender specific. Um, I think that that limits um, feminism, um, and I think that the goals of the goals of feminism. So maybe one way to think of it. We can all have different goals. So, you know, at one point, the goal of feminism was to uh, create social 
structures that would enable women to be, to, 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 to inhabit all the roles that men inhabit. Well, do we really want that? Maybe some do, but not everybody does. And so for, 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 for other feminists and other kinds of people, that's not the goal. The goal is some other form of social equality, not, not just to participate at a higher level in a hierarchical structure, but rather to uh, change the hierarchical structure into a more horizontal structure and have a more genuinely democratic uh, politics and more um, uh, equal distribution of the, both the benefits and the burdens of a society. Um, we notice the difference because we are, women are burdened in specific ways and are deprived of many of the benefits that a society purports to offer um, in specific ways. But um, as I say, for some, that means just entry into the uh, role of the privilege, while for others, it means rethinking the whole distribution. So it's a complicated uh, discussion. Thank you. I think we write some uh, links or some uh, differences in your point of view with the uh, Otto Neuer's thought. Uh, I, I don't know if it's uh, correct. The Otto Neuer's uh, 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 philosophy. Oh, right. mm -hmm. yes, yes. yes. So there are some differences in your perspective. Um, let me think. Um, so the question is um, to what extent. Uh, my work might uh, be influenced by Otto Neurath, who was a early 20th century uh, philosopher um, in uh, Austria. Um, a great polit well, I guess if he'd been a better politician, he might have been more successful in his efforts <laughs> to bring socialist politics to Vienna. But, you know. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Yes, I, I, mean, I, I you know I don't I, I, I haven't really read much of Neurath. I know a little bit about Neurath, so I wouldn't say that there are influences, but certainly uh, a, a sympathetic relationship um, with uh, Neurath's thinking. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, so 
So I was thinking, like, do you think that this diffusion of power would be much more like an ethical commitment that we, we should take into a systemic justice of all of the communities of knowledge? Not only scientific knowledge, but like all of these communities of knowledge, like, for example, farmers in other ecology, or also, for example, Pateras here in Mexico and Latin America. And I think that we actually have taken this example also for the case of a giant of subscription practices and so on. Um, so let's see. Um, what do I want to say? Um, Well, certainly. I mean, I, th I think, um, yeah, diffusion of power um, and um, uh, epistemic justice with, with the companions, uh, companion ideas. Um, uh, I think I, I prefer to stick with uh, diffusion of power because um, it is not restricted to uh, knowledge, but it's also restricted, it also includes material power. Um, so. But certainly, um, um, certainly I would, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll confess I haven't thought about this in the specific context of the epistemic justice and injustice uh, literature, but I do think that, that the alternative uh, virtues um, uh, lend themselves uh, to framework that wants to advance epistemic justice as opposed to preserving epistemic injustice. Um, yeah, so so I think there's a compatibility there, but I haven't worked out the details of how it would actually work. Um, and um, I think uh, uh, you know, situated knowledge, again, is a very broad concept, so I don't think it would, it would help me um, in uh, thinking about empirical adequacy, um, I think I think the the recommendation of those who advance situated knowledge with respect to empirical adequacy is to attend to uh, the the ways in which um, observation and data are uh, a function of the situation of the observer um, and the perceiver in a particular situation. Um, and uh, certainly, um, in um, when when feminists think about empirical adequacy and ask the question, to what data and to whose data do we want our models to be um, empirically adequate? Um, they're thinking in terms of this um, the, the perspective on the situated character of uh, much of the data. So, for example, we say that. that all the medical data that's based on research on male organisms, whether human or non-human, is, is very situated. Uh, that's the perspective of, of uh, uh, no, certainly it reflects an androcentric perspective. So, so yeah. So I think that there are there there are translation, um, but I would um, I'm, I'm not sure about the replacement. I think there's translation between the discourses. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, this was this was great, Professor. Uh, so I'm going to try to be a blunt uh, because your talk is very, very, very convincing. So I mean, we look at the, at the example and we can see how heterogeneity uh, plays an important role in bringing about a better solution. Then my question is, why is this so alternative? If it seems to be also at the same time such common sense. Right? If you present the, uh, the this value seems common sense, I don't understand why they are alternative values and not Well, I, I'll bet you can answer that question yourself. But uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> why are they alternative? That's the question. Why, why are these values, why do I continue to think about these values as alternative values? Well, because the traditional values are still the values that are 
advanced and um, uh, uh, other the, the, the traditional virtues are the virtues that are valued by still a significant uh, I don't can't think of numbers but a significant part of the scientific and philosophical community that's why they are alternative because they are still uh, in a uh, contesting a contesting position relative to the mainstream or traditional uh, values. Yes, yes, of course, we can make them seem common sense, and why wouldn't, why wouldn't everybody do this? But there are lots of forces at play that um, sort of collaborate in maintaining a certain image of what knowledge really is. Can I so that and that's a that's a kind of that's a political a political question. Can I, can I, can I yeah. Okay, so Jupiter said this this value because like you would consider a very traditional philosopher science or universe, a very very traditional politician involved in science policy and mm -hmm. technology policy. What can they reply? I mean, how can they say, well, still simplicity is better and universality is better? Uh, what, do you, what do they respond? Well, um, the, the challenge is show me. <coughs> show me how simplicity and universality have worked better. science communication is taught and you can get degrees in, um, in science communication and um, I think it's uh, what I would say based on knowing nothing because the kinds of things I've talked with you about uh, today is um, maybe to think about what it is that one wants to actually communicate and, and I think hear just about science teaching in general in the schools. Often in science teaching, we ask students to memorize a lot of facts. We present them with a lot of facts, and you know, learning science is learning those facts, where really what we, science is not the facts. Science is not its content. Science is the process of generating content in particular ways. And so if I were to think about what I would want to see in science communication is something about the processes by which scientific knowledge is, is generated. Um, I, I think the you know, idea of somehow transferring content that has been generated somehow or other um, is what perpetuates an alienation of the uh, 
knowledge on the one hand, and, and uh, what do I call it, a cognitive agent, the person who wants to know uh, about the world uh, on the other. But that person is going to be satisfied not by having their brain and head filled with a bunch of content. That person is going to be satisfied by being, by learning some methods for uh, experimenting, you know. Maybe, maybe they need to learn about having control groups. So you don't just count the things you want to count, but you also set aside a group and see what happens in the, in the control group. You don't treat it, you just, so, so there, there are techniques in experimentation that can improve, uh, that, that someone can learn. So I think that's one of the most important things to teach in science teaching is, is how to how to go about trying to find out about the natural material and social values. You know, what do we do uh, to learn that? And so, um, you know, I, I, there are many dimensions to science, science communication. I, I understand that, and some of it is you know communicating the, the latest the latest theory about X to a public that that wants to know and. Um, uh, you know, I, th I think that assuming that the public can't take complexity is a mistake. Uh, you don't need to be talked down to. You can take a little complexity. So that's what I would say. I would like to follow up with the question of the conversation. Uh, I agree that thinking the, uh, or assuming or naturalizing the hierarchy in science, seeing that it is generated in the scientific world and then, what is it, we are? Model, the 
going back, um, where the scientist is here, and what they are saying is, is there is dissolved. And this is what, what uh, she she states like the dissolution between um, the dissolution of this relation. Um, when you have a political stance and you participate in the process and then you understand that yourself as part of the phenomenon or the unit you're trying to understand, um, then all the uh, the power structure of the knowledge generating dynamic is sub subverted. And that's like your um, proposal for a feminist uh, epistemology. Um, so I would like to uh, address the last two uh, alternative values, virtues of knowledge. I think that applicability to human need automatically sounds like it assumes that human needs are obvious or maybe universal. Uh, so I, I would like to propose, instead of uh, saying applicability to human needs, uh, stating more like taking a political stance towards your subject or of knowledge. And then the second one, the last one, the decentralization of power. Um, I'd like to uh, propose to state it are like uh, support this relation of power intrinsic in, the, in, in knowledge. Um, okay, well, um, um, I, I take the point that human needs could be understood universally. I guess I didn't uh, think of it that way. I thought of human needs as contrasted with research needs. So, uh, uh, but, I, but I see the point. Um, human needs are quite heterogeneous and they vary from context to context. What what is the new need of one community is not going to be the uh, or even members of the same community. So I, I take that point. Um, and um, I, uh, I I think your idea of taking a more political, explicitly political uh, attitude towards uh, or version of the diffusion of power uh, heuristic um, is um, uh, I, 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 I can I can understand um, wanting to to do that. I think I'm um, to the extent that I'm reporting what I. from other people's texts. Um, I'm not sure I would um, attribute that aim to those who wrote the texts. Um, but I think it's certainly uh, um, a, a, um, a good interpretation for a particular community of the diffusion of power in this way. Anyway, um, if we're really going to diffuse power, then we have to for the extent relations of power. Um, the, the only thing I took exception to was your suggestion that there are relations of power intrinsic to knowledge. Um, I'm not sure what that means. Um, I think that even inside, like in the context, in the context of knowledge, this, uh, uh, these power relations are like in the ways we state things and state truths, uh, that that action is a uh, natural problem. Well, yes and no. Uh, I think that's a long discussion. Um, that, uh, as where am I going to step? Um, as humans, we we have a certain capacity, which is a linguistic capacity which enables us to um, use words, use language to describe the world. Um, 
And yes, when we do that, we are in some ways exercising a kind of power. That power, um, that power of using, as a consequence of using language, I would like to distinguish from political power or social power that is exercised as dominance. I don't want to think of my use of language to talk about the world around me, the people around me, as an exercise of power. Now, there may be another way to think about this, but, but that's, that's the kind of reaction I have to do with somehow power of being intrinsic to knowledge or to the use of language. Because, because if I want to uh, avoid hierarchical relations, if I want to avoid relations of domination, then I am in a very bad position. I cannot. If, I, if whenever I use language, I am exercising power in an inappropriate way, then there is no way. Uh, so. I think there are ways, specifically learning like indigenous languages or learning languages that are disenfranchised socially and politically, historically, specifically. So that's what they were pointing at, I think. Um, I wanted to ask specifically, can your potential be responsible use of language? Because I came today thinking we're going to talk about images and visuality and the magnetic power of science. And I think that that is an example of how you yourself exercise the specific authority over your capacity to denominate something as scientific or not. Right? Because if I tell somebody an image of science exists, they're going to say, yeah, I see a lot of images on science, right? Textbooks and classes on the walls when I go to the doctor. So I think, well, you yourself are in that space, and you should be responsible in how you think about it. I wanted to signal that to you as well. And I wanted to ask if you could talk about spaces where this talk or the subject of this talk could make your audience more uncomfortable, because your talk reminded me a lot about Rodney King's how you're a hundred developed Africa. And I don't know if you've ever boarded your questions through a post-colonial or imperialist studies lens, because there are a lot of studies about how one efforts, one agricultural efforts with um, socialist philosophies or cores try to be implemented, they work at the same rate that other capitalist developments don't work. So there is a direct inverse relationship and a a clear answer as to why these things aren't as political or obvious, non-obvious in certain sectors. So I wanted to ask you, it's, right, we all know that physicists is still care. So like, where do people receive this talk with a sense of urgency and importance that they didn't recognize before elsewhere? Well, um, I can say that the only reason I think mean, the second part of the talk is because when I gave it in India, I was told, this describes what is going on here. So yes, that, it was received with that degree of urgency. I wouldn't talk about, I wouldn't dare to talk about that context if I were not working with somebody from that context, who's been in that context, who thinks this is, this is useful. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I mean more specifically an academic field. Oh. And thinking between the sciences and philosophy and maybe the ways in which scientific people and philosophical people share a lot of values that outside of these spaces aren't as obvious okay. in one academic field. It's not, you know, I, I, I value straight and thank you for talking to everything. We're not, you know, poking holes in that, but more so, have you ever been hosted and there's more of like, of course, of course. I give talks to philosophy departments, and they are not that big. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And where has that been? If you don't mind me asking. North America. Like in what schools, for example? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How can I remember? 
<laughs> well, I asked you specifically because you're from Stanford and yeah. you hold a lot of weight. I myself went to Cornell for undergrad and I know what these types of talks, what mean and these spaces mean, and I would think that you'd remember at least one of them. Um, uh, I've given talks, I've given them, uh, I've given talks about lots of different, uh, different subjects. Um, but to talk about the, the virtues talk, I used to give quite a bit. Um, so, and I, I gave it as, as a version of it was my job talk. So, you know, so I gave it at Stanford, I gave it in all of Washington. Massachusetts. And, and the idea, but you ask me where I should give it. Where I should give it is actually in um, sort of agencies, international aid agencies. They're the ones who need to hear this, not philosophers. I mean, philosophers. <laughs> but, 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 you know, it's, it's, in, it's in, in policy settings. And that's where, that's where it, these kinds of ideas and do you not see that as counterintuitive to the goal to not reproduce these dependency relationships that are so inherent to NGO politics between North America and Europe well, and you know, Africa Asia? Yeah, I think it's a really difficult question because, um, you know, we have to think, I mean, maybe it's not true that the North and the West have all the resources. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's not, that, then that's great. Then the South doesn't need to pay any attention. The South can, can, can do what it needs and what it decides to do. But if the North has the resources um, and, and the North is, is making decisions about the ways to distribute those, those resources, then yes, they need to hear. They need to hear because they really need to change. And even if they only change a little bit, it's better than I don't know if they No, I don't think so. Are you sure? <laughs> it was on the tip of my tongue, man. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you both for coming. Uh, we have uh, another talk tomorrow. It's about the class.